Good day. Once again, we've gathered together and we're about ready for session eight. Sabbath, a time to review your life. As you think about your life, you might think about your childhood, what it was like growing up as a young man, young lady, and you may have many memories. Some of those memories may be quite humorous. Perhaps you were a pet lover. Perhaps you loved pets too much. Perhaps you liked pet food. Perhaps you just like food, period. Perhaps you were artistic. Perhaps you weren't. You just like to play in the mud. And you're much work for your mom or dad. Perhaps you were just curious. Perhaps you <laughs> did strange things. And one wonders if that's sweat on daddy's back or something else. Mm -hmm. Kind of a passive aggressive evil look this young man has. Perhaps your mother left you with your father and babysitting man style was quite an experience. Perhaps you are now a grandparent as we are and we enjoy our grandchildren. There are our three grandchildren and we repeat in our mind some of our own childlike ways as children as once again we see another generation before us. Well, session three, as I said, is a time to review your life. Looking back at childhood memories, days of young adulthood, and perhaps those aren't memories, they are reality right now. But you get the idea. We all have children or childhood memories. And obviously the childhood memories come before we have children and we hope to have children. Well, it is said by Jim Smith in a book entitled An Arrow Pointing to Heaven that children with a disease called rickets scratch lime from the walls. So too, when we do not feel loved, we scratch acceptance from the walls. We will do anything to get it, climb the ladder of success, try to be funny, acquire possessions, alter our bodies, if we are religious, this will often translate into becoming scrupulous. We will try to be perfect or saintly in order to find acceptance from God. Every attempt to find this acceptance in anything but God will eventually fail. And we will either have to deny the pain and try to ignore it or medicate it with a drink or a pill. But we must have it. The human soul cannot endure to be unloved. As you review your life, your childhood, you might pause and realize that you've wanted acceptance. You have been looking for acceptance. You've been trying to get attention by being successful or perhaps being highly religious and thought of as scrupulous as a fine Christian person. Maybe that would give you the recognition that you desire. But any attempt to find acceptance, significance outside of God is going to leave us empty. Sometimes that emptiness is a very painful thing that we try to, as the statement says, medicate with a drink or a pill, but we have to have it. Our human soul cannot endure to be unloved. 
When I read this, I looked back at my childhood and I realized that I wanted acceptance. And along with lacking acceptance, I was short. I was not a large young man or boy. Uh, sometimes other kids would look at me as I was smaller and, and say, uh, wow, you should have been in fourth grade. You're not in sixth grade. You're in fourth grade. No, I'm in sixth grade. And I was short. I didn't grow tall until I became a high school student. So I know the syndrome of being short. Remember Zacchaeus in the Bible? He was a man who was short, so he climbed a tree. So it is when we feel short on the inside, unaccepted or unloved, neglected perhaps, that we look for something to get us attention. I had some artistic ability, not like my son, but enough to get some recognition with pictures I drew. So I kept drawing pictures and thrived on comments people made. And then I shifted from art, drawing to music, music. And I got some attention and approval by that for some time. But even in ministry later in life, I found myself receiving attention and craving on the attention I received as a pastor, as a speaker, as a preacher. And I, I thrived on compliments of people when they were moved or touched or even brought closer to God. I liked it. I felt loved when they said those things. But then there was the opposite as well. As I found in planting a church, there were the good times and there were the hard times. The things I hadn't planned on. And I remember one event after the next where people were moving away from our congregation. And it was a wonderful thing to watch young families who had just received Christ come to know him and grow in the church and become leaders in the church. But then something happened in the community where jobs were leaving and people with their jobs were leaving. They were called, they were asked to go to other places that needed them. And so they accepted offers to work in other cities. And I found then one family after the next moving away. Oh, there were new families coming into the church, but my heart was so attached to some of these families that had become so close to us and these individuals, the best of friends. My heart was breaking over that. I was sorrowful. And every time a family moved away, I felt like the pedestal that I had climbed, which I now called the church, and I didn't realize until this time that I had a Sabbath that I talked about, the first Sabbath, I began to look at myself and it was like God was speaking to me and saying, the church now has become your pedestal. You stand on the pedestal and when things are good, it's nice to be on that pedestal, but when something goes wrong, like a person leaves the church, your pedestal starts to rock and you feel uh, uh, on equilibrium, you feel that it's shifting and it's breaking down beneath you. Someone is cracking your pedestal and you are emotionally shaken and the attention that you're getting through this now is negative. And I realized as God opened his word to me and I read then the first chapter of Philippians where the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ to die is gain. And that statement, for me to live is Christ. That is, Christ is my pedestal. He is the rock. I will no, have no tree that's taller than Jesus Christ to climb up into as I feel short and lacking. I'll no, have no greater love pedestal than Jesus Christ. I had worked hard to get accolades in school and I got degrees from fine institutions of learning. And I thought that having the statement pastor and eventually doctor in front of my name would give me a kind of love and recognition among people. But I find it didn't do that. In some cases, people just got jealous of you. They didn't love me more because I had a degree. I thought by having the title pastor in front of my name, but people would really like me. Many did, but some did not like me because I had that title in front of me. And I found that any title other than Jesus Christ and Jim Anderson in Christ, anything but that would disappoint, would not satisfy. 
but I had a title that could not be stripped from me, taken from me. I had a pedestal, a tree that I was in, we could say, that was strong and able and would not crack or break under the pressure of any winds. And that was Jesus Christ, my rock, my pedestal, my tree. And this is what I learned in that first Sabbath that was so amazing as I sat in the car for some five hours straight. God reviewed my life before me and I felt so much peace and relief and I could let go of the other things I was propping up, the things I was doing to get attention and to feel loved. Oh, the, there are still temptations to try to be loved by other people, other things, by accomplishments. But when I come back to it, it's only Jesus Christ that provides what I really, really need. And so I practice and promote this idea of reviewing your life. We've learned to release our concerns and that is a first step to a Sabbath experience. But the next is to review your life. You may not do this every week that you come uh, out of, uh, you know, your activities to be in solitude with God, but it may be an often occurrence that you review your life. Something might happen in your life where you open the Bible and you say, that's for me, God is speaking to me about that, but I need solitude to really uh, work this out into my soul and, uh, and so forth. So Sabbath is a time to review your life that is very, very important. And we've talked already about some of this, uh, but I want Lois to speak as we talk about reviewing your life and facing your problems and how this aspect of Sabbath uh, was very meaningful for her and the whole family and caused her to send me out to the park quite often. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. I told you earlier that um, when, we, when Jim took that first Sabbath, I explained a little bit of what, what was happening and how even that first time it impacted us. Well, as this became a regular part of our lives, I could tell when a week or longer would go by and he hadn't been to the park or he hadn't taken his Sabbath. And there would be more tension in the home or things just weren't right. So this is what I literally would do. I would pick up the phone after he had left in the morning and I would call the church office and I knew that no one else was going to um, get the answering machine and, and the message that I was going to leave Jim. The only one who was going to get it, I, make, I was careful about that, would be Jim. And I said to him, and this is true, Jim, don't come home until you've been to the park. That's how much it affected us our relationship and our relationship with our boys. And I could tell over the course of time when he got out of that rhythm, when something stopped him from going to the park. And it became so important to us and to me that that's what I did. I said I would call and leave a message and say, Jim, you need to go to the park. So that's how much it impacted what was going on in just our time as a family and, and relating to one another. That's how important it became. And that, that happened almost right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was. Right away, and to this day, if I go two or three weeks without this solitary or solitude time with God, without a Sabbath, I begin to act and think like an unloved person. But it's in these times of quiet before God where uh, He shows me my life and He shows me the idiosyncrasies, the weaknesses, the childhood fears, the dreads, the memories, and He shows me it and He still loves me. You think when you see something unpleasant or ugly about your life that God would say, you go over in the corner and just think about that. But instead, the moment you admit it, and maybe it's a sin, as soon as you admit before God a sin, a wrong thought or whatever else, as soon as we admit it, 
He doesn't push us in the corner and ask us, corner and ask us to think about it. He embraces us. He rushes in. And so with a repentant person, they may think, well, God will shun me now that I know my guilt and dirt and sin. No, as soon as you admit it, he rushes in to embrace you. And so I can talk about I, with God anything that is wrong about my life, something I regret, something I wish were different. But he loves me in spite of all that. And it's in these points of solitude that I hear him. And I feel loved most of all in these times of solitude. And that way I'm not, I don't need to the same extent the love of people. I think we're made for one another and that's important. That's significant. <clears throat> but our baseline of love must be our love that we discover his love for us in times of quietness, solitude, and it may be also in groups of people as well. Well, I hope you get the picture. It's a time to review your life.